Well, thank you. And I just wanted to say how much I appreciate the music and I appreciate the person running the camera, but because you know what? It doesn't have to be perfect. If you just step out and do something, God will make it good. Amen. So I want to talk to you tonight about the attitude of increase. And I'm going to start with a question. What's the absolute worst thing that can happen to anybody? What's the absolute worst thing that can happen? And how you answer that question is going to be, is going to show you how spiritual you are. Because if, you, if your answer was, the absolute worst thing that can happen to somebody is if they died and went to hell, then you can pinpoint your life. But if you're thinking about carnal things, about, well, you know, if I lose my eyesight, if I lose my husband, if I lose, then we've got some work to do yeah. in the spirit realm. Amen? We've got some work to be thinking. I mean, we've got to be earthly-minded because we live here, and we can't live on a cloud. But we have to be spiritually in tune with what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Amen. The answer to that question is, what is the worst thing that can happen to anybody is to die without Christ in their lives. Yeah. And as Christians, this is why we come to church. We come to church for, and we're teaching this in, in our classroom, in our children's ministry, for correction, for reproof for edification, for building up, for teaching, so that when we go out there into the world, we're better Christians, we're better people, and we're more likely to extend a hand out to somebody who's on their way to hell. And that's why we come to church. We don't just come to church to sit here. Amen? Right now, you all have a job. Right this very minute, you have a job, and the job that you have is to pull out from me from the anointing, from the teaching that you're going to get. Yeah. You can't just sit there and say, well, I've come to church. Amen? Mom. So in the attitude of increase, so many Christians are trapped into the world of this victim mentality of the world. You know, have you ever seen Christians? Their, their lives are a mess because they post it on Facebook all the time. What's going on? I'm not the funny little stuff, but some things you wonder, do they have any victory in their lives at all? We can't be like that. We're supposed to be victorious. Do we ever have problems? Yes, we have problems. Yes, we have problems. But we're supposed to be overcomers in yeah. Christ. And the world is full of victim mentality. And if you're not careful, and if you're not reading the word and not fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit and fellowshipping with the saints, you can get sucked into thinking you're a victim too. Amen? There's a better way to live. Increase means to make numerous, multiply, grow. And I brought some little increase because we're going to go to John 3. And since the kids are in school, which I want to remind you, in two or three weeks, we're going to start back up Wednesday night children's church. We could use some help in there. Amen? Even if you don't want to teach, if you just come and be a warm body and keep the teachers company so that they feel like they've got allies in the class. Amen? We need allies in the class. Is that correct? Yes, yes ma'am, we do. So I'm just throwing that out there. You won't be seeing us too much, although we're not going to be we're going to take turns on Wednesday. My philosophy, because for years when I was in, in a church, I worked all the time. And I worked and worked and worked. And I won't do that to anybody here. I'm not going to make anybody. I'm not going to guilt you into doing more than what you can do or guilt you to even what I think you can do. I'm just going to, if we can't, if we don't have enough people to do something, we're not going to do it. And that's the way we're going to do it here. I'm not going to take triple jobs or make somebody do a triple job or, you know, somebody's got to work themselves to death. We're not doing that. Amen? Mm -hmm. So I'm just putting it out there that we need some help. But I want you to pray and seek God because if you just do it because you feel sorry, then you're going to really have a bad time. Amen? So anyways, we're back in John 3, and we're going to start with verse 26. 
And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptized, and all men came to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, he rejoiced greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This is my joy, therefore is fulfilled. Verse 30 is what I want you to zero in on. He must increase, but I must decrease. I heard a minister say once that we must come into the land of even before we come into the land of true increase. And in the Amplified, that verse, John 3.30 says, He must increase and I must decrease. And in brackets it says, He must grow more prominent and I less so. So we're going to do a little math lesson. Can you all see that? This is the land of not enough. All right? I'm greater than Jesus. I make my decisions based on what's field what feels good. Remember the scripture? He must increase and I must decrease. In this illustration, for those of you who thought that, um, you know, well, what was the worst thing that could happen and was, well, something here on this earth. No, the worst thing is that you would die and go to hell. So we're thinking, okay, now we got to change our thinking a little bit. I make my decisions based on what feel good, what feels good when I am bigger than Jesus in my life. I do what I think is the right thing. And you read time after time in the Old Testament, it will, it'll talk about the people of Israel, and they did that, they did that which was right in their own eyes. Yeah. So that's when Jesus is not as big as we are. I make my decisions, I'm passive, I'm needy, but I'm still a Christian. Amen? And now we've got the land of even, me and Jesus, equals. I'm contented, but I'm not challenged. A lot of us sit in this position where we're content. We love Jesus, but we're not challenged. We don't want to step out. You know, when somebody makes a call for ministry, we go, well, you know, I'm too old for that. Well, heck, all of us in the audience are too old for that, right? I mean, come on. You know, what an excuse is that? I'm too old. I've done that already. Don't want to do it again. No. See, but we get so content, or you feel like I put in my time. Don't want to do that no more. I'm th That way here, Jesus and I have become equals. Now I'm making some decisions, and he's making some. Okay, sometimes it's based on my feelings. Sometimes on the word, depending. But this is what it looks like in the land of abundance is Jesus is greater than me. He's greater. I've let him be greater in my life. I have more than enough and plenty to give. And we're not talking about money because I want to tell you this church is one of the most giving people for a small body and for people that are retired and have been retired for a long time this is a very, very high tithing church. You've been trained well. You notice that Pastor and I, we don't talk about money that much. Don't have to. Because you just you guys know how to tithe and give. So this this message isn't about increasing in money. How many of you guys understand that? It's it's talking about other things that are way more important. I have enough, I have more than enough for me and plenty more to give. The, the abundant life. Not about money, about joy and peace, about your time, about your talents. Life is so much more than just money, amen? The abundant life. And abundance comes with obedience. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they might have life and enjoy life and have it in the abundance to the full, till it overflows. Not material, but the devil came to steal our joy, kill our motivation, and destroy our faith. 
And we have to guard against that, and that's why we come to church. And then sometimes we partner up with the devil. You know, we, we let him accomplish it, and he keeps us in the land of lack because we just get depressed, we get discouraged. Anybody ever been there? I was there very recently, and I thank God for a godly husband that can snap me out of that. Because he doesn't just pat me on the back and go, oh, you poor little girl. You poor little girl. No, he goes, are you going to let the devil run over you like that? And I got mad. It's like, the devil? This is a problem. And it's, you know, but he doesn't let me get away with it. So you need, this is why you need to go to church with people that aren't afraid to tell you the truth aren't afraid to say something because you know what it got me to thinking and then I had to come back and apologize so I said yeah he's right I don't like it but he's right so we can get we can get into agreement with the devil and we can stay discouraged or depressed and get critical and get negative and let him to start to steal from us steal our joy and our peace In Leviticus 26, verses 3 and 4, the word says, If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. Okay, so it's not enough just to know them. We have to do them. I will give you rain in due season, and the land shall yield her increase, and the trees of the field yield their fruit. But the key is obedience. We can't do it our own way. We have to do it God's way. And God promises it, us increase if we walk in his ways. So if you're not experiencing increase and joy, love, and all the fruits of the Spirit, then we have to examine our ways. So we're going to look at some scriptures tonight so we can examine some ways. And it's not a condemning message by any means. You know, we all have to examine our own ways. Amen? And sometimes, you, sometimes we hear a message like this and we get our back up because, well, you know, like, whoa, you know, who's she talking to? Well, I'm talking to me first, then I'm talking to the rest of you. But we're here to learn, amen? We're here, here to help each other. And when we see somebody slipping, we can restore them. It says, ye who are spiritual, restore people. It's not enough just to say, well, you know, just let them go on their way. Because why? Because the worst thing that can happen to somebody is to die without Christ. And people are walking away from the faith all every single day. People are walking away. And we have to help and be guards. So we, if we see somebody starting to veer off the path, that we can gently help them to get back into the way. Or, or if God moves you to not gently say anything, then we can always pray for them. You see, we have so many jobs to do. When we're, when we're retired, we think, well, because our bodies just can't, you know, we can't get on that roof anymore, and we can't do this anymore, and, you know, when I've been down in the grocery store, I have to have Clarence help me get back up again, and I, so I just don't, if it's on the bottom shelf, I'll sometimes I'll just leave it rather than try. But, you know, when you get older, you face things that, you didn't think about when you were younger. I mean, how many had a primer of what was going to happen when you got older? And if we did have a primer, we wouldn't have listened because we were young and healthy and doing our own thing. So it would have seemed so far in the future. But now, look, here we are. And I'm younger than most of you in here. So it's like, look, look at here we are. And, and the rest of you are saying, you're not even there yet. You just wait a little bit longer and you'll be really there. You're just putting your toe in right now. But sometimes we think because we're older, we can't do anything. And this is when we have to really pray and say, God, you know I'm older. And listen, if all of your assignments were over, you wouldn't be here because God would call you home. So if you're here in this room, that means you still have something to do for God. Amen? So I'm not going to let you get away with the fact that you can't, nobody pulls the old card in here. I mean, Clarence tries, okay? He's 10 years older than me. And if he doesn't want to do something, he says, you knew I was older when you married me. But I don't let him get away with that. I said, 
no, you cannot pull the old card, and I'm not going to let anybody in our congregation pull the old card. Amen? Because if God was finished with you, you wouldn't be sitting here. You'd be up in, the, in glory. So God hasn't finished with you yet. So it behooves you to seek the Lord every day and say, God, you know that this body can't work the way it used to, but today you need to tell me what I can do for the kingdom. Amen? It might be something simple. It might just be to pray. Or it might just be to make a phone call. Or it might just be to write out those military cards, write out two cards a day that you, that you have since January and it's really harassing you and you haven't done it yet and you want to do it. it. It might be something simple. It might not be what you think is going to be so darn hard because God is not going to give you something beyond what your physical capacity is. He knows what you can't do. Amen. So he's not going to tell you to do something that you can't do. But there's a lot of things that you can do. There's so many things you can do. And I can't even think of them right now, but it's up to you to seek the Lord every day when you get up and say, God, what would you have me to do to further the kingdom today? Why? Because the worst thing that can happen to somebody is to die without Christ. So we're all responsible. We all have a part. I don't care what you're dealing with physically. We all have something we can do each day or we would have already died and gone on. Our assignment would be over. But it's not. So here we are. So Jesus, when his assignment was almost over in Matthew 25, we're going to go to Matthew um, 25. And he began his farewell in Matthew 24 and continued in Matthew 25, he told three parables. I'm going to read all of them, and it's going to be a little extensive, but I want you to bear with me, because they all three tie together. So the first parable is Matthew 25, 1 through 13. He said, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. And they that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go ye out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of some, give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to, to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went with him. So the marriage and the door was shut. Afterwards came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say to you, I know you not. Those have got to be the sorriest words in the Bible. I know you not. Can you imagine thinking that you've served God all your life and seeing the master and he says, I don't even know who you are. That, that's another sermon. Verse 13. Watch therefore, for you know not neither the day nor the hour when the, wherein the Son of Man came. And there's, very, there's a lot of interesting things in these virgins. They all had lamps, but they didn't have oil, so they were all saved to some degree. The lamps represented the word of God. They had Jesus in their heads, in their hearts, but only five had Jesus in their life. It's not enough to have Jesus in your heart. You've got to have Jesus in your life. We can't just ask people, do you have Jesus in your heart? A lot of people say yes, and you know that they're so far away from God. You know, what's your life like? Show me your life, and show me the fruit of having Jesus in your life. It says in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. Five had the illumination of the Holy Spirit, because the gifts and the graces of the Spirit were evident. Five spent time with God. Five foolish had head knowledge. 
The five foolish virgins came up, they shook the hands of the preacher, they went back to their seat and their lives weren't changed, but they kept coming to church. The five wise had intimacy with the Holy Spirit, but the five foolish went to church and only had religion. There's a difference. That's why we're not going to press you for doing works. That's why we're asking you to pray about this stuff. I mean, man, we're all adults here, right? Let's just pray. And if God lays it on your heart to do it, then do it. Amen. Don't have to be pulling. I've been in churches, and I'm sure you have been in churches, where they, you know, made you, they've shamed you to do more than what you can do for offering, more than what you can do for your talents, and more, more than what you're willing to do for your time. And it didn't produce any fruit. It all came from the flesh. The five wise virgins showed the necessity of, number one, habitual preparation. Sometimes I'll get up later in the morning because I'm not working nine to five anymore. So time isn't time. And if it's to the point where, like I love to go to my water aerobics class, but if I get up at like eight o'clock in the morning, I won't go because I won't have enough time to spend with the Lord before I go. Because I have to put God first. Amen? So, you know, if I don't get up on time, shame on me and just pick it up from there. Now, there's sometimes when you have to go without your preparation and stuff. I mean, that's just common sense. But if it's something that it's for exercise or something like that, I'll bag that before I'll bag my time with the Lord. It's like, no, I'm sorry. I can't do that. I've got to spend time with God first. So habitual preparation. You've got to have an expectancy. When you walk through this door in the church, expect that God is going to speak to you. See, sometimes, and we've all been Christians for a while, sometimes you can get lax and lazy coming through the door. Amen. You know, we just come here because it's time to come to church. And so, you know, we kind of just sit back and we go, oh, you know, there she goes on the, the ten virgins. I've heard that a thousand times. Well, you might hear something new tonight or hear it differently, even though you haven't, maybe you've just read it this morning. But you've got to come in with an expectancy. That's what the five wise had. The five wise were diligent to increase their spiritual life and that affected their natural life because they had oil in their lamps. And then we can learn from the foolish too. And sometimes the, the consequence for neglect of duty doesn't show up right away. Sometimes the consequence doesn't happen until we're far out from the actual deed that we've done. Why is that? Well, the mercy of God, because God is trying to corral us back. So if, even though the consequence is delayed, we sometimes we get lulled into thinking that there's no consequence at all just because there's a delay. Like if you're really critical about something and there's not been a consequence, sit tight, it's coming. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're critical or if you're judgmental, if you, you know, this, 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 and this, and there's been no consequence, if there's no repentance, there will be a consequence. Amen? Amen? Yeah. So that's what we've learned with the foolish. The foolish did nothing but go to church. And they went out of obligation, but they didn't go out of love for God. All ten were virgins, but their actions and their attitudes distinguished between them when it was time for the bridegroom to come. And what did Jesus say in verse 13? He said, watch therefore. That was the first warning, was watch therefore. He's trying to warn us in these parables because he's getting ready to go to the cross. So he wanted to warn us to watch. We can't get complacent ever. The five were consistent and steadfast. They adhered to the same principles and no matter what. And so they saw growth. You know, sometimes we think we've got to have this huge growth all the time. But just look back a year ago. And if you're in the same place, I would be very surprised. I think that we've all grown in a year, amen? Spiritually speaking, we've all grown. We've all changed. We're all more mature than what we were a year ago. If you look back and you can see the growth. 
if you can't see any growth, then say, Lord, please forgive me and then help me to get back on. The five foolish barely got by, even though they were saved. They could never overcome the adversity in their lives. These are the people that just can't seem to overcome, and they've always got a problem. They're always in drama. They're always in this. You know, and I'm not picking on people. Do you understand that? I'm not picking on people because it's our job as more mature Christians to try to help them along, to try to help them to see the reality of Christ and the cross and to be sure that they're really born again too. Sometimes if people have multitudes of problems and they're always in a crisis and always that, they may not truly be born again. So we have to really be sure that people are truly, truly born again. And we have a responsibility to be sure that people, that their, their worst thing that would happen to them does not happen to them. Amen? Amen? So let's go to the next parable. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his this Bible is so small. And the lighting is bad, so please forgive me if I'm stumbling a little bit. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them five other talents. And likewise, he that received two, he had gained other two. But he that received one went and digged it in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants come and reckoned with them. And so he that received five talents came and brought the other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained, and besides them, five talents more. The Lord said unto him, Well done. Though thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make, the, make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things, and I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received one talent came and said, uh, said, Lord, I knew that thou was a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and I went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there, there thou hast that, that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and thou gatherest where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my com coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that shall hath shall be given, and he that has abundance, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he has. And cast the unfaith profitable servant into the outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The talents were rewarded according to the faithfulness of the person. And everyone had an opportunity to increase. Just because you have a little talent doesn't mean that God is not expecting you to increase. You know, and you say, well, I can't do much. Well, take the much that you can do and give it to God. And what happens is people that feel that they can't do much, sometimes they do hide it and they do bury it. Well, I can't be like sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, so I guess I'm just not meant to do anything. And they take it and hide it. And the thing that you've hidden is the very thing that's going to be somebody's answer to prayer. And you've hidden it. Because you didn't think you were all that. And see, it's wrong to do that. And he showed you right in the parable. Even that one talent person could have increased. They could have increased it and had two talents. And God would have said, enter in. Enter in. What did he tell them? 
He said, well done, good and faithful servant. That has been faithful over a few things, is what he told them. And he would have told the person with one talent, if he had multiplied it, he would have said, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. See, he's not looking for, you know, sometimes we think, well, we've got to be, you know, have a multi church facility and we've got to have everything here and we've got to fill this place with 200 people and then we got to start another campus and then and we're going to do this and that and he's he's saying take the talent that you have and do something with that well done good and faithful servant amen he's not going to make you do more than what you can do none of us are going to go out and run the Boston Marathon. Why is that? Well, obviously, none of us are fit to do that. So he's not going to ask you to do that. It would be an extraordinary mir miracle for any one of us to do that. We're not trained to do that. But he might ask us to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, you know what? I've been praying for you. Is everything okay? God laid you on my heart. That's your one talent. See, that's not hard. But sometimes we make it to be so hard because we just don't feel worthy enough. And God said the purpose of the talent is not to preserve it, but to multiply it. And then who knows, maybe the next day you'll make two phone calls. And then you'll build up a little more confidence and you'll do something else. But what's in your hand is what God is giving you. And to bury it and say, well, you know, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that. It's just an excuse. And when we face God, we're going to see all of those excuses fall to the wayside. Because he's going to say, I equipped you to do that. And you hid behind these excuses. The one talent person is the one who's content to come to church and not do anything else. Just come and sit and not do anything else. Well, what can I do? Pray? Even if you, you pray for a little bit, and we have prayer at 5 o'clock on Wednesdays, and I'd like to expand that to maybe do another times so when other people can come. But um, even if you can't come at 5 o'clock, well, what can I do? Well, you can have a teachable spirit when you come in. That doesn't cost anything. Are you all right with this message tonight? Yeah. Because sometimes I get kind of focused and I get really intense when I'm up here. But um, you want to have a teachable spirit when you come in. The other thing you can do, well, I can't do much because I'm old and I can't move around. I can't do that. Well, how about greeting the visitors? All right, well, this is laughable. We don't have any visitors tonight. Well, we'll greet, <laughs> greet one another. <laughs> When we go to the fellowship on Sunday night, don't sit with your friends. Go sit with somebody that you're not you normally sit with. Little things, something very tiny. But it's something that brings huge growth. See, you can do something. Be positive. Don't be critical. Everybody can do that. Find something positive. The unprofitable servant isolated himself. He had a wrong picture of God being mean. He just hid behind. And some of these people, you can't, you know, you, you find out how they are and they go, you know, well, where have you been? Well, I've just been home watching television. It's just me and Jesus. It's just me and Jesus. God didn't save you. So it's just you and Jesus and your little two-person club. God saved you so that you can take your talents and you can refine them and you can use them to help other people get into the kingdom so that the worst thing that would happen to them is not that they would die without Christ. Amen? Yes. You, you know, you can't just say, and, I, and I've known people over the years, well, it's just me and Jesus. And, you know, you really, you, you just want to say, why is it just you and Jesus? Why? Why would you do that? You're taking your one talent that God has given you and you're hiding it. And what did he say to them? 
He said, cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That, to me, sounds like a warning if we don't use our talents. Does that sound like that to you? That's the way I read it. Because I only know one place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and it's not heaven. So we don't use our talents. See, God's, Jesus made these parables. He said, I'm about to be offered up on the cross, but I want to give you some final instructions before you go. Don't just hide your talent. I, mean, I look at when Janie, when she's at the door and she's smiling, she's greeting people. I mean, to me, it's like, wow. If I came through the door and I saw that smile, and I her, she's such, a, she's got such a warm, giving personality. I see Barbara in the parking lot. I'll run out in, in the heat to see Barbara because she's always so positive and cheerful. And some of you, I, I look at your other guys and. And it's like, wow, you know, I like to talk to you because you're so inviting and cheerful and, and nice. And that's the way we have to be to people. Amen? Not just, it's just me and Jesus. You know, it, it's wrong. That is wrong. You're hiding your talent. And that's just not what God has called you to do. God called all of us to cooperate. And we've not experienced increase in this house because as a body, we haven't increased our level to receive increase. I mean, we started out with 10 people a year and whatever ago. We're up to 30, maybe 40 if we're all here. To me, that's tremendous increase. And we haven't filled the church yet, but we're on our way. I mean, that is a lot of people. But you, so you can't say, well, where's the increase? There's a lot of increase. And we're increasing as we increase our ability to receive the increase. Amen? But it takes everybody to do that. It's not just a few selected few. And it can't be a few selected few because we're too small to have a few be a few, right? So the warning is, don't, in this parable, is don't be lazy or you're going to lose what you have. Oh, I hate to say that L word. Okay, Matthew 25 and 31 to 46. When the Son of Man shall come in glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And then the king, then shall the king say unto them on my right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answering him, saying, Lord, when, when, we, when saw we the uh, uh, hunger and fed, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we a stranger and took him in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it unto the, one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was a hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we saw we the uh, hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you yeah. did, not, did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, and the righteous into life eternal. So there was a warning to there, too. And it's love demonstrated. This is the service test. 
When did we not do it? We've got bins out there for hope. And you know, some people say, well, they don't need the food. Well, they maybe don't need the food, but have you ever tried to catch a fish without any bait? The food is bait. That's all it is. Because we don't give them enough, right, sis? I mean, there's not enough to really do something, but it's, uh, it shows we care. And it, you meet people that way that you would never meet otherwise. So it's just a bait. How do, why do we do these boxes for the shoe boxes? So somebody else can hear the gospel. It's all about the gospel. It's all about giving. It's all about doing something. And we don't even make it hard. We say, well, you know, if you can bring in a pencil or a bar of soap or use a tube of toothpaste, something small. And I realize that many of you are on fixed income. You can't go out and do a lot of things. We're not asking you to do a lot. We're asking you to seek the Lord and say, Lord, what's my part? What can I do? You know, if sometimes if we're not in order, then it takes us a long time to get things done. Like today, I was looking for my notes for something, and I thought, oh my gosh, I wish I had some of Clarence's order. He, he's so orderly with things. It's kind of maddening because he's so orderly. And I've got kind of like my notes here, my notes there. And I, I said to him, I wish I'd met you a long time ago. You would have straightened these out for me. I just had everything all over with. So it takes him less time to get ready for things because he's in order. He's got everything in order. If you have a giving heart, you'll do your part. Say, Lord, give me a heart to give, right? Because God so loved the world he gave. Now it's up to us to give. So Christians who are not in order emotionally, physically, or domestically will spend all of their time, talents, and energy maintaining their own life and have nothing left over to give. And if you're not in order, it can be one of the most overwhelming things to get in order. Because it's like, God, where do we start? Good place to start is to say, God, help me to start. And show me. God might have you, if you're out of order, he might have you do just one corner or one thing a day. Because he knows that anything else would overwhelm you. But don't just throw up your hands and say, well, I can't do it. And I'm not going to do it. Because look, you're hiding your talent again. So the first step one is to get in order. Things that you don't have in order, get them in order. So that you don't have to spend that much time looking and trying to figure things out. And where did I put that? And where is this? So get things in order. And just ask the Lord for help. Maybe somebody can come in and help you to put things in order. You know, if it was me... I would like to do that myself, though. But God might lay it on your heart to have somebody to help you. I don't know. But get things in order so you're not always having to put yourself in order or having to do that. But the conclusion, these three, now we've got three parables. We have the virgins, the ten virgins. We have the talents. And then we have the, the sheep and the goats. To conclude... First of all, was the conclusion is the ten virgins needed the Holy Spirit to direct us. All right, so that's what we learned from the first parable. By spending time with him so that the second part, we can use our talents to increase our spiritual life, our domestic life, and our financial life. So that the third one is to demonstrate our love to people. So see, it was three different talents, but he tied them together very nicely. And if we do all three... We're going to see an increase and an abundance in our life. Amen? So right now we have to identify areas of deficiency that I'm trusting that the Holy Spirit has been ministering to you during this time. And we're going to confess it and ask God to reveal to us so we don't have lack anymore. Amen? That we can live the abundant life. And it's... It's hard. Listen, if you're dealing with physical issues or you're dealing with things, it's hard to think abundance. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I had that toothache last week, and I wasn't thinking abundance. I was just thinking, please let it stop. <laughs> so sometimes when you're hurting, it's really hard. Amen? And that's when we need to call out to other people and say, I need prayer. I need help. 
because I'm dealing with this. And find somebody who's not going to judge you or, you know, say, well, you know, I, we used to have people in our churches that if you had a, if, if they were sure that if you were sick, it was because of sin. They were just sure of, you know, and they pray, you know, undo the heavy burdens and, you know, make sure that you show them what the sin is. I mean, sometimes, let's face it, sometimes the body breaks down. Do we have a part in it? Yeah, we haven't eaten right, we didn't get enough sleep, or we're, we're dealing with something. But find somebody who's going to pray and, and pray in faith and, and not be so condemning because it's all not, all sickness is not due to your sin. We live in a sin soaked world. Sometimes things happen. Amen? You know, I was kind of maybe not so diligent when I was water picking and flossing. I don't know. But I know that it's better this week. So, you know, find somebody, if you're having a struggle, that you can trust that will pray for you or with you and help you. Humble yourself and say, I need help in this area. I need help. Because otherwise, if you don't do that, you're going to hide that talent. And you're going to start pulling away and you're going to say, you know, I'm too sick, and I'm too old, and I'm too this, and I'm too that. And see, God hasn't taken you home yet, so you've still got work to do. Amen? Everyone in here, nobody can pull the old card. It says, and this is the last scripture in Matthew 11, 28. It says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So if you're burning down tonight, he's going to give you rest. And he's going to help you. Because I don't like to put things on people that, you know, well, you got to do this. And you got to do that. And you got to do this. I want you to just identify the area for yourself. Because it's for your own good. And it's for the other people's good that we're going to lend a hand out to. So that the worst thing that's happened to them is not going to be dying and going to hell without Christ. And that's what the bottom line is. I don't want anybody to go to hell. Do you? No. I want to do everything that God has set out for me to do. Because I know I may not be knocking on doors or going down and giving pies to people and sitting down at the kitchen table. But I know I'm doing what God has told me to do. And what I'm doing, I feel that God is telling me to do it for whatever, whatever thing. And so you go out and do your thing, and I go out and do my thing, and we'll all be obedient. And then that's what brings the increase to the body, is because we're all obeying God. Amen? Don't hide your talent. Don't say, I've got nothing to offer. Every one of us in here has something to offer. And nobody's too old, nobody's too sick, nobody's too whatever. You've got something for the body of Christ. Amen? And we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you, honey, can you come up to the... You know, we're going to ask God to reveal the root of, of lack in your life. If it's bitterness or fear, insecurity, maybe it's just plain old laziness that you really think that you know, man, I am old. and Because uh, sometimes I'll get up and go, yeah, I'm so old. And it's like, <laughs> that's so old. <laughs> but after we identify the root, then it's your job to go find some of God's promises for that area. And become proficient rather than deficient. Because we want to let our light shine in this community and in our families. We want God to know that he can trust us, that he can send people through these doors, and we're going to minister to them. And it's not just up to the pastors to minister or the leaders. It's up to every single one of us to minister to people that come through the door. Think about the first time you've gone to a church, and they weren't friendly, and they didn't. I've gone to churches where they haven't been friendly, and... Um, you know, I mean, not that everybody, you can call all everybody, but just give them a smile. You know, don't scowl at them if they sit in your seat or, you know, they do something annoying. Just welcome them. So we want to let our light shine. So, Father, we just thank you tonight. 
Lord, that if I've stepped on toes, God forgive me, that I wasn't necessarily meaning to step on toes. But Father God, there, there's a conviction and then there's a condemnation. And I'm truly believing tonight that if there's anything, that there's a conviction of the Holy Spirit tonight. Father, that you would forgive anybody who's, who's thought that they don't have anything to offer. But Father God, that they would just go in repentance. Father, that the eyes of their understanding would be open. That they would see, Lord, that yes, they do have things to offer. Father, I thank you for each one that's suffering infirmities. And Lord, that makes it so hard to do anything during the day. But Father, I thank you as I declare by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed in this room. We are healed. We are healed. And Father, I thank you for those who have been struggling with depression and discouragement and doubt. Father, I thank you as we speak victory over their lives. Father, that they have a fresh anointing and a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. Father, that they would see that their purpose is not over with. Father, that you would breathe into their lives and let them see that they have a purpose, that they have their life has meaning to it. Father, for those that are struggling with loneliness, Father, I thank you that you not only send the Holy Spirit to help them, but Father, you would send a friend. That's all we need, Father, is one or two good friends. But Father, that those that are struggling with loneliness, that they would find friends. Father, that you would help them to be active and not passive. And Father, we are thanking you. We give you praise, Lord. We declare that everyone in this room will use their talents. Father, they will, they're not going to lack in anything. But Father God, that if Jesus is, is greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world, that Jesus would be greater in our lives and that we would have more than enough to do the job and to complete the race that you've called for us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You know, every one of us have a talent. <laughs> every one of us have a, a calling and a purpose. Every one of us have a divine purpose in our life. And it may not be, you know, some people, sometimes we, we compare ourselves with people that's in the limelight, so to speak. But that, that's not it. I'll tell you what, every person's purpose is important to the kingdom of God. Every one of us here is important to the kingdom of God. You know, Cindy comes on Friday nights to our practice. And we practice. And God always gives her a fresh poem or a writing of some sort that is pertinent to what we need for our body and our church at that particular time. And God's using her. Amen. And I, I, listen, somebody said, well, that's not much. Well, it's a whole lot. Because what she says is a whole lot to the person that was receiving it at that time. And they need it. I tell you, I always look forward to it. See what she's got for next Friday, to the next thing, you know. Praise God. But listen, we've all got something. We all have something to give. Something to just share. Something to just be part of. Listen. The body can't function without the whole body. Amen. Amen. You might be able to breathe without everybody, the arm, the leg, the, all that, but you, you, you know your big toe is important. <laughs> it helps you keep your balance. Amen. Everything is important. And tonight, every person here, every person here is important to the kingdom of God. You're important to Faith Assembly Church. God brought you here for a purpose. You're not here by accident. Hallelujah. <laughs> and every one of us are as important as the next one. Praise God. You know, somebody says, you know, one time they, they think the preacher, if, if the church increases, it's the preacher that's increasing. No, no, no. Uh, the Lord gives the increase. But it's the increase because there's people that's taking time to intercede and pray. Taking time to do the little things that people don't recognize and see. It's those little things that cause a church to flourish and to grow. 
And I'll tell you something, God's got something important for every one of us. We just need to come to that place. Listen, have you ever grown lax in your attitude towards doing what God's called you to do? We all have at one time or other. And believe me, I'm like Sister Pat. If I don't spend that time with the Lord, you got a grumpy old man on your hands. <laughs> but it's important to spend time with God. You know, she has her private time. I've got my private time. We pray together on things and we believe God together, but I can't, I can't cause her to grow and mature. It's, it's her relationship with the Lord and getting in with God and seeking the Lord that that growth comes. Same way with me. I can't depend on anyone else. But you know what? Tonight, we need each other. Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm so glad you're part of the body because we need you. <laughs> Amen. And let, let's, let's, let's make an affirmation to God tonight that we're going to be used of the Lord. Amen. Sometimes you don't understand. You, know, you can have a word for somebody, just a smile for somebody. That's exactly what's needed for that person to bring them up and to bring their spirit up. So as we do what God tells us to do, let's stand to our feet tonight. Praise it. Did you enjoy that tonight? Amen. God gives my wife some great insight, some things. And I tell you, so I, I tell her, I said, I wish I got that first. <laughs> now I got to go study for myself. But I want us to make a new affirmation to God tonight. Commit ourselves to Him. Commit that small talent, whatever it is. It may be small in your eyes, but it's big in God's eyes. Commit it to Him and say, Lord, I'm going to be the best that I can be. I'm going to do the best that I can do. You know, I, I appreciate it. Listen, we got a good group here. These people that come up behind me singing, I, I appreciate that. Because they're, they're singing from their heart and God's given them the talent to sing. <laughs> there is a difference. You know, amen. But thank God for the talent that God gives and the gifting that God's placed in you. And we can all do something for the Lord. And then we just, all the rest of us just chime in with them. Amen. Praise God. But there's a little course. I believe it should be our prayer before we leave tonight. Just ask God to just minister to us in a special way. Well, Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, don't refuse me. Surely there's a work that I can do. Even though it's humble, Lord, help my will. Hands just sing it as a consecration song, Dan. Jesus, use me. Oh Lord, don't refuse me. Surely there's a work that I can do. Even though it's humble, Lord, help my way. You know, some of you probably be wondering if I wasn't behind the piano one Sunday. <laughs> and everybody would say, well, where's Brother Clarence? Where's Brother Clarence? And I just come in and sit on the front row. So, well, what happened? What happened? I said, well, my talent, I just did it today. I didn't want to use it for the Lord. <laughs> well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> but you know what? When we come through that door, let's don't hide it under a bushel of them. Let this little light shine. Amen. Glory to God. Well, as you go tonight, worship the Lord. Hug somebody's neck. Well, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, 